Hello, everyone. Good uh, morning, good evening, uh, and welcome. And thank you so much for joining us for the second uh, Wave Financial uh, and OSL Digital Perspectives, uh, Digital Asset Perspectives series. Uh, we have an incredible lineup of speakers for you today, and we're so pleased to have so many people joining us from all over the world. Um, we will be uh, featuring a number of different topics over the next two and a half hours. Um, and first, we will have Dave Chapman, Managing Director at OSL, uh, giving us a uh, uh, some intro introduction remarks here. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, thank you for joining us today in what will certainly be an interesting and lively discussion. Uh, as Henry alluded to, I am Dave Chapman. I'm an Executive Director of VC Group, uh, Asia's only audited, listed, and insured digital asset firm. It's also the parent company to OSL, uh, the region's leading digital asset platform for trading, custody, and SaaS products and services. Uh, it's an absolute privilege uh, to have the opportunity to provide the opening remarks uh, for today's event. Um, before we begin, though, uh, I would like to take a moment to reflect upon today's theme, you know, the future of Asia's capital markets. Uh, it's fantastic to think that even during these unprecedented times, we've managed to link to gather hundreds of people from different countries and backgrounds to discuss a topic that is more relevant today uh, than ever before. Uh, and, and what we've learned uh, over the past several months as we've navigated these extraordinary business and social circumstances is that technology and innovation are critical tools that help us drive forward in the face of adversity. Uh, and this is what we're seeing in capital markets now more than ever, technology and innovation whether it be uh, in the in public or private sector, it's really what's building the future as we speak today. Uh, digital and online has transformed markets in any way that was considered that was considered unthinkable even only a few years ago, and it's creating a completely new asset class and method of value transfer. Uh, the fact that we have such well-respected financial industry brands uh, such as the CME Group, Jump Trading, TD Ameritrade, PwC. Bloomberg and others here today alongside very innovative digital asset companies such as Fidelity Digital Asset, OSL, Wave Financial and Kraken, it really speaks to the established legitimacy of the digital asset sector and the inevitability of the complete integration and adoption of digital assets in the traditional financial system. Um, and whilst we acknowledge that those speaking at our event today have leveraged the opportunity by being you know, a first mover in this space, they're not the only advocates of late. You know, recently, we've seen other household brand names in finance they're entering this sector with force, from legendary uh, investor Paul Tudor Jones, uh, suggesting that Bitcoin is a hedge to global markets, to Renaissance Fund taking a digital assets position, and arguably most notable uh, of all, uh, former digital assets bear, uh, JP Morgan, swinging a complete 180 degrees to commence their stake in this space, initially at least, by providing transaction banking services to two regulated crypto venues in the USA. Uh, it's undeniable that institutional interest in crypto is, in, is increasing. Uh, a recent Fidelity digital asset survey of 800 institutional investors found that nearly 80% appreciate the appeal of digital assets and more than one third are already invested in this market. Uh, similarly, at OSL, we broke our monthly trading volumes and highest number of active clients in the super volatile month of March, but then again, breaking that record only two months later in May of last month. Uh, regulation was incomprehensive in many regions around the globe just three years ago, but it's now being enacted on rapidly in all of the world's major financial jurisdictions with innovative, and yet common sense approaches quickly taking shape. The existing digital assets ecosystem, which had been widely criticized in the past for vulnerabilities and lack of security, has greatly matured. The integration of quality custodians, robust security, AML, KYC, and other compliance and security protocols are being ratified for industry standards and mandatory conformity. The debate is no longer about when or why, but how. Digital assets are the future of capital markets, and that future is now. Asia has proven itself to be the center of global growth in digital assets and blockchain technology, and the region clearly leads in terms of usage and investment in digital assets, blockchain job growth, 
and technological innovation. China is one of the nations leading this charge, with President Xi in October of last year stating the country should seize the opportunities presented by blockchain. And this was one of the first instances of a major world leader publicly supporting blockchain tech. Together with Wave Financial, we've assembled three panels today to explore the how, after which you will hopefully be a believer if you're not one already. And if you are, today will provide further confidence and conviction in why you're holding such a view. Our first panel, Where is the Smart Money, will feature Wave CEO Dave Seema, TD Ameritrade's Head of Digital Assets and DLT, Sunaina Tuteje, apologies Sunaina, and Fidelity uh, Digital Assets, Tom Jessup. And will be moderated by uh, Bloomberg's one and only Richard Salamat. It will discuss where institutional investors are investing, why they're investing, as well as the investment journey that they are undertaking. Our second panel, Myth Busting, Are You In Your Own Way? includes King & Wood Nellison's partner, uh, Ursula McCormack, PwC partner and crypto leader, Henry Aslanian, and Kraken Digital Asset Exchange Chief Legal Officer, Marco Santori. This panel will discuss and deconstruct common misconceptions around entering the digital asset space from several perspectives, including a client and professional services viewpoints. Our final panel on product innovation will include, will include OSL Wayne Trench, Head of Nomura's Wholesale Digital Office, Paul Ridley, and CME's Managing Director of Global Head of Equity Products, Tim McCormack. Tim McCourt, apologies. It will discuss where the most advanced and innovative uh, digital asset products have come from and where the market is headed in the near future. And for our closing note, we have the utmost privilege of hearing from the President and Chief Investment Officer of Jump Trading, Dave Olson. Dave will share his views on the evolution of this decade-old asset class and how, how it has radically changed from one of really experimentation to the institutional trading that we're witnessing today. And then finally, Dave from Wave will actually close out a webinar today. So what does the future hold? It's really anyone's guess. Uh, but for capital markets, the future is now and it's with digital assets. So in closing, thank you again to our speakers. Uh, thank you to our panelists and thank you to our moderators. And of course, thank you to the thousands of guests who registered their interest in this event. And thanks to those who have provided us with their time and attention for what will be a fantastic two hours. Thank you. Hello again, everyone. Uh, now we are going to run into our Smart Money panel, which will be hosted by none other than Rashad Salamat from Bloomberg. So Rashad, I will hand it off to you and I will disappear. Thank you very much, Henry. And uh, welcome, everybody. And I'm joined by three very well-known guests. We've got Tsunayna Tuteja, Head of Digital Assets at TD Ameritrade. We've got Tom Jessup there as well. He's, uh, he's President of Fidelity Digital Assets and certainly last but not least, David Seema there from Wave Financial. Okay, let's kick things off and get right to the gist of it. And Tsunayna, why did the smart money really miss this rally? Well, who says we missed the rally? Um... <laughs> Um, listen, I think it depends on your definition of smart money. Uh, at TD Ameritrade, you know, we, our mission has always been to kind of break down barriers and enable the retail investors in the RIA community, kind of access capital markets and now crypto market. And, you know, we would submit that those constituencies have actually done pretty well over the last few months, uh, regardless of all the shade that they're getting from certain financial media and maybe some uh, institutions. So I think uh, for a variety of reasons, I'm sure we'll double click with you. Uh, our clients have kind of uh, had uh, a more uh, kind of a a steely uh, experience during this meltdown. And I think education is a big component of it, kind of you know, holding their hand, educating them, helping them understand what's going on and kind of making the right choices. Tom. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that uh, the institutions missed the rally at all. I think what we've seen, particularly since the, uh, the beginning of the lockdown in the US and in Europe at the beginning of March is that if anything, uh, interest in the space has redoubled and anyone sitting on the fence in terms of largely either hard money thesis around Bitcoin or even pre-havening positioning certainly came into the market. And I think we've always maintained as an institution serving institutions in the space that the influx of institutional money will looks more like an incoming tide than a wave. We don't have the peaks and troughs of retail flow, but we do see steady interest up and to the right from institutions. And that's borne out by the survey 
uh, that we released last week. Uh, and David, absolutely. I mean, you know, we've got internet celebrities like Dave Portnoy uh, going and lauding it over everybody, saying that the retail, the retail guys, the winner, essentially saying, and I think, and I quote, it, it, quote, it's no debate. I, I killed him. He's dead. He's referring to Warren Buffett. So it goes to the same thing, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, um, I mean, there was a moment in time and, you know, mid March when you know, the market crashed and a lot of the retail guys that had shown up kind of quickly exited, but they, they seem to come back pretty quickly. I mean, Wave Financial, we do you know, kind of more wealth management, asset management. So kind of, you know, mostly for crypto people, but now starting to do a lot more, you know, kind of non-crypto traditional investors. And we're starting to see a large, you know, returning interest. And obviously the macro environment for crypto, you know, this is what Bitcoin was built for back in 08. You know, so I mean, and most of us in the industry that have been looking at this stuff for a long time kind of feel like, look, if, if this isn't crypto's moment or particularly Bitcoin's moment, like there never will be a moment. <laughs> you know, we'll never see this kind of quantitative easing again and fiscal irresponsibility and all sorts of things and pandemics and recessions and race wars. And, you know, and there, there is nothing that no, no, there's no stronger set of tailwinds any of us could have drafted if you're a crypto believer than what we're seeing. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, Sunil. And, you know, we've also, you know, we, there's no doubt that retail's gone in and we've got so traditional markets uh, joined in by what's going on with the di digital side of things. So they've been moving in lockstep and in large part here as well. Does this show kind of a, a, a maturing of this particular sector in a way? Yeah, you know, that's something we've been kind of assessing and studying carefully. Um, you know, there was a lot of commentary in March when the traditional markets were kind of going haywire. Like the analogy that was often used is, you know, the equity markets are behaving akin to a toddler throwing tantrums, waiting for its next fix from the Federal Reserve. And the analogy I would use to describe Bitcoin's behavior over the last few months is, similar to perhaps an awkward teenager trying to figure out who he or she wants to be when they grow up and trying to find its way. Um, and, 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 you know, there's no doubt that in just a limited 10 year history of, you know, Bitcoin, let's talk about that as the, as the core asset here, the number of narratives that have been ascribed to it is astounding. Everything from, hey, it can be a payment rail, it's going to be a safe haven asset, it's uncorrelated alpha it's uh it's a hedge against inflation you know i i think it's it's become like a rock shark test and everybody sees into it what they want um and, and you know and there's no debate that you know when bitcoin kind of uh, you know, moved in tandem to the S&P, a lot of those narratives were punctured in the short term. But I would submit that the sample size is still limited of 10 years. Uh, I mean, gold has been around for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And even gold at times was moving in tandem with the S&P. So I think we owe Bitcoin and crypto at large a longer runway to kind of stress test some of those narratives. Uh, absolutely, Tom. Uh, you know, to, to everybody, just j uh, jive and jump in whenever you like. And uh, I'd like to create a bit of heat as well as light naturally here as well. And uh, and Tom, you know, when you, okay, retail has kind of been kept the crypto side of things going in a way. But do you need a big institutional buy-in really to make this asset class one which people are, could, all people look at it with a degree of more seriousness? I think it's happening. Um, I think, you know, by any metric, certainly our own business, certainly uh, the businesses of others on the, the conference or the, 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 uh, the webcast, uh, futures volumes. Um, I think that it's maturing, you know, 10 years on people are understanding the asset class. There's um, what's interesting is that there are several theses that people apply. You know, it's uh, if I were to summarize what most institutions think, it's a uh, uncorrelated tech play with asymmetric upside. That's how they largely describe Bitcoin. Um, it has diversification properties in a, a, a broader uh, portfolio. And um, I think it is, uh, you know, it's, it's behaving like a maturing asset class. It's largely been uncorrelated. Yes, there have been times over the past few months where it's been highly correlated. But I think someone can correct me on the stat, but in the history of Bitcoin, um, there's only been 20 odd days or 30 days where the correlation to, for example, the S&P has been uh, at a level where someone would say it's highly correlated. And over a 10 year, 11 year track record, that's, um, that's not a lot of time. To you, David, same question. Yeah, I mean, yeah, so as Tom said, yes. I mean, I think the correlation is overstated in the near term and people always look at really short periods of time 
you know, I mean, it's, you know, this is not a correlated asset. If you, even if you add in the correlation of the last 30 days, but if you, if you look over the last couple of years, the correlation to gold and Bitcoin is, is much higher than the, you know, the equity markets in Bitcoin. Um, so it's a little, I think, you know, the world is just kind of going risk on, risk off every other day. Um, so, <laughs> you know, I think we're kind of seeing some of the bouncing around, but I, I think this will show to be an uncorrelated asset, you know, pretty quickly. You know, again, I think the, the, the track is set for Bitcoin to, to, you know, to do some interesting things over the next couple of years. Um, so, yeah. And Tom, I mean, you recently had a, a, a survey, didn't you? You had a Fidelity had the, the, the release their annual investor, institutional investor digital asset survey. What struck you about it? What stood out for you in that? Yeah, I think that the, you know, generally speaking, all of the metrics are moving up and to the right in terms of positive directions. So the number of institutions that were constructive on digital assets increased year on year, the number of investors or the percentage of respondents that had allocated to digital assets increased year on year. Some of the concerns that institutions have, uh, namely price volatility, market manipulation, um, lack of fundamentals in which, uh, with which to analyze the, the asset or the asset class those concerns continue to drop. And I think as others have said on this panel, it's really up to uh, us to continue to educate institutions and bring them to this new asset class. Um, that's certainly the role that we play. We see ourselves as a bridge. And so we're very happy with the results of the survey, but there's a lot of work to do. One, one thing I would just say, when we talk about 36% of respondents owning digital assets, obviously we looked at many different segments of the market. And I think what's been kind of misunderstood is that that is the number of respondents. If you were to talk to a crypto native hedge fund, obviously the number of respondents saying we own digital assets would approach 100%. You look at uh, traditional investors, pensions and endowments, that that response rate is in the single digit percentages. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done to get to the broad swath of institutional investors. But in every segment we surveyed year on year, we're seeing an increased interest, which we believe is positive. And so then I'm, I'm sure you would also probably just anecdotally kind of agree with that or, or not. Tell me. I love I, I, you know, I, 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 I hate to not give you the drama by disagreeing, but <laughs> I, I do agree. And I think I think even on the retail and the RIA segments where we're myopically focused, you know, recent events have definitely been a tailwind. And I think Dave alluded to it. Uh, in in his comments earlier, you know, the, you know, on all of our platforms about a, a few months ago, I told my team, let's put a little button. We have millions of clients who engage with us through our online platforms, digital and mobile properties. Let's put a button that simply asks, you know, are you interested in learning about digital assets? Do you trade digital assets? Do you want to trade digital assets? And I'm like, listen, if 10 people respond, yay, you know, it further codifies my business case, I'm happy. Well, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of responses every day chiding me why we weren't moving fast enough. And that's and that and that has that pace has picked up even more over the last couple months. I happened to be talking to an RIA yesterday who was bemoaning, oh my God, I feel like I've missed it. You know, uh, is it too late for me to get in? I'm like, no, it is not too late for anybody to get into digital assets. So I think the current macroeconomic events, you know, we have this unique opportunity to harness that and use that to educate constituents who may be sitting on the sidelines or have been skeptical about it and really to kind of create that big tent and invite them in. Oh, absolutely. So I want to stay with you a second because, uh, you know, you're being all Pollyanna about this. So I want to ask whether TD themselves are directly invested in these assets. Um, so that is not our business model. Even on the traditional side, we don't get into, you know, uh, uh, kind of trading uh, our own book. However, the way we've invested in this category is in three ways. One is unlocking a whole new suite of products and on ramps that will enable market participants, new era of market participants to engage with this asset class. Um, and second is through partnerships and investment in startups in the ecosystem. Uh, and then third, where we've spent a, an enormous amount of time, given the constituents we serve, is really around education and advocacy, both in terms of creating a rich repository of credible education content. So, you know, listen, I serve a, a spectrum of consumers who range from crypto savvy to crypto curious to crypto skeptic. 
And as I tell them, it is totally okay to be skeptical. You get to ask me all the hard questions, but it is no longer kosher to be ignorant and to sit on the sidelines. You have to lean in, you have to learn. Uh, so education, and, and the other reason education is important for us is uh, we know from data that we've collected over decades on the traditional trading side that an educated investor is a more confident and active investor. And given digital assets, which is still nascent and has a level of complexity, education becomes even more paramount. But delivering that education in a way that's more kitchen English versus throwing out, you know, sexy technical terms at them, that might be a turnoff. So I think the change in the tone, the change in the modality and extending that education uh, and that we do the same with our regulators. Obviously, you know, we have a seat at the table with regulators and we have kind of represented the voice of the retail client for years and we're using that opportunity with them to kind of educate the regulators and also bring them along because obviously you know their engagement is critical i'm coming to you in a second tom but david you i'm sure that you're probably in the same boat aren't you um yeah i mean our our lp base is a little bit different we most my, my background is mostly running early stage venture funds you know you know wave maker our instead of traditional funds i started I manage about a half billion. We have, you know, Tomasic, World Bank, you know, Hanwha Securities, DBS, you know, a lot of institutional investors there. But they're looking to us to be tech visionaries, you know, risk capital, <laughs> you know. So, and, and all of those, I mean, like, you know, Union Bank's also a pretty large LP of ours. Like, all of those have already built out crypto platforms, similar to like Fidelity's. They've built custody. They've built their, their venture arms are investing in crypto projects, you know, blockchain projects. You know, so and most of our LPs are Asia, which is way ahead of the curve. And obviously the audience in this conference is Asia. Um, you know, we see very slow movements in the US and Europe compared to what we see in, you know, Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong, um, which is why we're excited to do a conference with OSL, focus on this part of the world, just because, you know, again, there's so much more activity there than there seems to be in our backyard. Being here in the States. So, so Absolutely. And, and Tom, you know, the original question was, uh, have you at Fidelity been investing directly in this space? Yeah, we uh, we maintain a small portfolio of venture investments in the space. Um, we also, uh, since roughly 2015, it had a mining operation at Fidelity. One of the ways that we actually began to learn about the technology when we decided it was something worth focusing on. So, yes, we maintain a very small position in uh, mined Bitcoin. Um, in addition to running running my business, um, and we've been um, you know we've been focused on this space now for about five years. Wow, I didn't think it existed five years ago. Anyway, that's just me, uh, David. I mean, goes to VC, goes to the average investor as well here. But how do you value one of these? I suppose one of these crypto uh, currencies or what, whatever that. Because I mean, ultimately, shouldn't the uh, uh, the question really be about no, what's it, it, it what's it trading at? The question should never be at what valuation it's trading, but it's the valuation that it deserves. How do you come to that? And of course, there's a mismatch quite often. Yeah, it, it's no different than traditional venture investing. I mean, it's you're looking at tokens, either it's token economics. I mean, you know, there used to be a you know, in end of 2017, obviously there was this theory that all the old paradigms were thrown out. We're back to measuring eyeballs, you know, using an internet term um, and things like that. And it turned out that was all wrong. It just people people made a lot of bad investments. <laughs> um, but you can, you know, you should be able to DCF any investment, a venture investment, a token investment, or whatever. You have to put you know, whatever assumptions you put in is what you get back. But you can do it. And we're seeing that now. We saw the altcoin shakeout in 2018, where tons of these projects, you know, went to very low values, if not zero. And now we're starting to see more realistic valuations based on network activity, based on you know, kind of you know where the platforms are and things like that. But it's exactly the same as, as I think putting on a traditional VC hat. You know, you look at the company's pro the prospects. You know, what the economics actually accrue to that token if it is a token investment. Just FYI, we mostly do non-token investments in our active strategy funds. We mostly do equity, VC, seed stage investments. Um, so, but it's a, you know, but the cadence is all there. I mean, it's, you're, you're trying to find good teams with vision and, you know, and, and a great business plan and solving a big problem. And, and obviously the token is a harder thing to value in some ways, but it, the fundamentals are still there. Yeah, and Selena, you know, it comes to you as well, because as you are sort of like, 
uh, a cheerleader for all this. You've got to come up with some way of valuing uh, these propositions here as well. Not what they're trading at, but are they worth that? That's the thing. And you can't have a, a, a one-way bet as some retail investors are at the moment thinking that nothing's going to come down. I mean, they think that Newton was wrong, it would seem. Well, I mean, Newton was proved you're right. I'm oh, sorry, Ben. <laughs> no, go finish your thought. No, I mean, Newton was proved right. I mean, prices did come down. We had the huge crash. You know, the market went down 85% and you know, by the end of 2018, there was a huge amount of washouts. And then, you know, now a lot of the biggest coins that have come out are things like the Binance coin and, the, you know, um, the exchange coins and things like that, where there's a relatively, I think they're overvalued still, but I, there's, a, there's a very easy, you can't actually look at cash flows, you know, for Binance, you know, 10% of revenue flows to re burning those coins out of existence. You know, that, that's a very, you can look at it on a more traditional basis and say like, okay, Binance is really big. They generate a lot of revenue. The token must have you know X Y Z value, um, so you you right. have seen the shift. I'd say Selena and then Tom, please. Yeah, uh, yes, I am optimist, uh, guilty by guilty by charge, but I do have a grumpy side, so not to worry. Um, I think uh, you know akin to what's the what Tom and Dave said, our venture investing in this space is more uh, focused on the picks and shovels. Uh, in terms of building the ecosystem and less so on uh, investing directly into any token. And that investing thesis is really predicated, I would say, on two things. One is really looking for what are those gnarly problems that we need to solve um, and you know, understanding why those problems need to be solved and why this technology uh, is uniquely qualified to solve some of those problems, not just for the crypto market space, but then what can we transfer back to the capital markets and kind of create that synergy. But, and then the second thing I would say that's important for us from an investing perspective is, you know, I live in the Valley. There's this ongoing competition between an incumbent and a new entrant. And there's a saying that, you know, can an incumbent with scale, uh, you know, recognize an opportunity and execute with speed before a startup attain the scale. That's really the competition, right? It's the scale versus speed. And for us, through partnerships and investment, we kind of get the most, best of both worlds. We are able to bring our core competencies and our scale to the table and co-create with a new entrant who can perhaps move along with speed. And we have the benefit of kind of riding their coattails. And then, you know, and I think that adage of, what is that, one plus one equals nine. And then the last thing I'll say is, you know, there's, um, I think it's a Jim Barksdale quote that there's really only two ways to make money in business. Either you're bundling things or you're unbundling things. And usually the, the, the pendulum swings one way or the other. What we're seeing happen in the crypto ecosystem, which is just so fascinating, is we're seeing aspects of this ecosystem bundle and we're seeing aspects of this ecosystem unbundle. And you can do all things by yourself. And I think that's where making investments and having a venture portfolio becomes critical. Yeah, look, I, I would say as it relates to decentralized applications and new token projects, I agree with Dave that it's very much uh, like venture investing. You're looking for the best teams. In some cases, people are looking at the, uh, the, the quality of the people committing code to these open source projects, what other projects they've been associated with in the past. They're looking, basically that would be the proxy for management. And then obviously there's an expected return component in terms of these protocols being adopted at scale around some use case in the future. As it relates to something like Bitcoin, we're continuing to see the evolution and emergence of models that there are many of them, but one model uh, which folks are looking at and, and are perfecting is effectively the network economic model, which is a function of the number of uh, participants on the network as a leading indicator of the value of the scarce asset that exists on the network. So I think, um, again, you think about bridging the old and the new, some of these new, when people talk about fundamentals or valuation models, the things that you look at in this space look different than uh, what we would look at in the equities markets or other developed capital markets. But I would say, and I don't know this to be true, but how long did it take, you know, for how long were equities around before Graham and Dodd showed up and created the canon on value investing? It's going to take investors to develop the right frameworks to value these assets, whether they're cryptocurrencies or decentralized applications. And there are enough people now focused on this where some of these uh, standards and approaches are becoming more widespread. David, just quickly here, as it's only to you, uh, as a VC, et cetera, 
what's the fundraising environment like? Uh, I mean, well, two parts. So for fundraising for funds, in, you know, in, with COVID, you know, world or whatever, it's, it's poor. Um, like, <laughs> you know, people are mostly kind of going risk off and they're looking for pretty safe bets and things like that. Um, so we've, you know, you know, for on, on average, I'd say that's been a little bit slower. Now, it's been kind of surprising that for entrepreneurs, like projects are still getting, you know, funded pretty readily by the crypto, you know, crypto blockchain funds, traditional VC funds. I'm actually kind of very, like, pretty strongly surprised that it hasn't slowed down more. You know, I'm, I'm pretty convinced the world's heading off a cliff um, and, and that this is all going to get a lot worse before it gets better. Um, so we've, we've slowed down. Um, but it, a lot of our peers seem to be pretty, you know, aggressive and, and not really slowing down a whole lot as, as far as making new investments and, and so forth. Now, you talk about the environment. Now, Elena, how does the current economic and social environment affect the way you're looking at this? And how has it affected this in many ways? Yeah, so a lot of our thinking around this space and really a lot of new uh, adjacencies that we might be entering into or building is really client driven um, and kind of guided by the voice of the client. So as I alluded to earlier, the interest for uh, an awareness around digital assets and just uh, the demand for education and access and on ramps from clients is definitely kind of, you know, taken up, which is nice to see. Uh, and, you know, we're really leaning in with uh, education and content. The other aspect of it is, you know, yes, digital building for digital assets is different. But, you know, it's that saying, you know, there's nothing new under the sun, it's just a different iteration. And I think it was Matt Levine of the uh, amazing money uh, stuff blog who once quipped that, you know, Bitcoiners are simply relearning the financial history, but at a much accelerated pace. So, you know, we try to kind of keep a and keep an anchor on, you know, what have we done and learned and how have we overcome moments of turbulence over the last 40 years in our traditional business and kind of what can we pour over and what can we take from that as we lean into this asset class? Yes, there's a whole new set of problems for which no playbook exists and, you know, we're all kind of flying the plane while we're building the plane. Uh, but there's a lot of stuff that, you know, we can kind of reflect back and learn from history and in fact apply and accelerate our journey when it comes to digital assets. Yeah, Tom, very quickly, the current economic environment and how it's affecting this space, very quickly. Yeah, so look, our survey ended at the end of February um, and we had a very positive response a year and year. I would say since the pandemic, interest has only increased. So I think if you were to do the survey, you know, two, three months after we ended it, you'd see even more positive results. So I think that for anyone who has a macro view on Bitcoin as a hard asset, I think um, they are more aggressive in putting money to work. Um, at the same time, we continue to see the steady tide of uh, folks are developing their own investment theses and then eventually thinking about allocating to the asset class. So um, the macro environment's generally been positive for this space. Uh, last question to all of you, just one minute each on this. It's your final word. Now, everybody, people talk about the new normal. I'm sure we've all had this phrase pop up every few years about the new normal. It always turns out to be looking like very much the old normal. Okay. The thing is, is it going to be a new normal or has COVID essentially accelerated what was there in a way that wouldn't have happened unless this pandemic had occurred? Quickly, and uh, for you, David, first. Yeah, I mean, I'm assuming you mean just kind of everything, not necessarily relevant to yeah. Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think this will just accelerate a lot of things. I mean, the, the work from home, the, the you know, kind of slow down in business travel, the you know, wearing that, you know, we're masks for very long, but we'll wear them for a while. You know, I, I do think this is a big change for the world. I think we're seeing some of that, you know, with the, the protests and things like that. I mean, obviously there was a trigger event, which was terrible, um, but I don't think this, I don't think that trigger event would have spurred what happened now had it not been for this macro environment of COVID and people being at home and, uh, and a lot of this frustration and whatnot. Um, so I, I do think this is a, is a new world, you know, yeah, I don't love the after the, the phrasing, <laughs> you know, but I, I do think this is real. This really is a change. I don't think the world will ever be quite what it was before. I think people will 
kind of have to figure out a new normal around around these new aspects. So, Tom. Yeah, I mean, I mean, maybe sort of narrowing the focus, I just think a lot about picking up what Dave said about the future of work. And, you know, Fidelity is a very large organization with millions of clients. And um, our entire organization has been working from home for the past several months. So I think about the implications for everything from commercial real estate to travel to technology. And I think once um, we all come out of hiding and end up being back in a work environment, I think we'll see more of a hybrid work environment where there'll be much more fluidity between uh, being in an office or traveling and being at home. And I think just in that small domain, that should have significant implications uh, on how we think about the future of work. I don't, I don't think we go back to the, the old ways of working. Well, that's one aspect. So then uh, last word for you, from you, just that is, uh, is it a new normal or is it an accelerated old normal? Um, well, since you brought up our BFF Newton earlier, maybe I'll close with him. I think his first law stated that things in motion tend to stay in motion unless, you know, there's an external force. And I think COVID is that external force, though, you know, I am a little bit skeptical. I think there's a lot of things that this will accelerate. I, the things that were already kind of going the way of the dodo are going to go to the way of the dodo faster. Things that we were already starting to adopt, I think people are kind of, it's gaining traction faster. But I'm a little bit skeptical about how drastically things will shift. Um, you know, the notion of people are never getting back on planes and all of that stuff. I'm a bit skeptical about that. I think specific to our category, what, I, what I'll end with is what's heartening for me, despite some of the negative commentary, is we've bemoaned in the financial services industry for years how households uh, haven't participated in the benefit of the capital markets that they haven't, you know, chosen to invest or don't know when to start or how to start. And, you know, I, I, I like that, you know, we welcome the whole new generation of investors uh, into the market, whether it's digital assets or traditional assets. And, you know, I think Bitcoin is making saving and investing sexy again, and that's great for everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Selena. Uh, to DJ, uh, Tom Jessup, and of course, David Seema. Henry, I'll pass it back to you now. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Rashad. Cheers. Thank you very much. That was fantastic, Rashad, and all of our panelists. Uh, it was a pleasure hearing your insights. Um, to our audience, we will be back in about five minutes with the next panel, uh, which will be an overview of regulations in Asia and beyond. Thank you. Hello again, everyone. Uh, now we're going to start our regulations in Asia and beyond panel. And I'm going to hand it off to Kenny Lee from OSL, who will be uh, your moderator. Kenny, take it away. Thanks, Henry. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our next topic, Evolving Regulations in Asia, where we hope to debunk some myths and misconceptions about how regulations will affect the digital asset industry. My name is Kenny Lee. I'm the head of OSL Singapore, where I spent the last few months knee deep in licensing for the Singapore Payment Services Act, which has now leveled me up to super expert status on regulations. Uh, joining me today are some very well-known experts in the industry who are continuously sharing their wisdom to help us navigate and adapt to these changing regulations. First is Ursula McCormick, a partner at Kingwood Mallison, who is one of Asia's leading blockchain and financial regulatory lawyers who has advised many firms on these evolving regulations. Welcome, Ursula. Hey, Kenny, I. Next is uh, Henry Arslanian, the global leader of crypto for PwC, a best-selling author and creator of the Crypto Capsule series, where I'm quickly able to find the top five things I need to know within 60 seconds. Henry, welcome. <laughs> Thanks for having me, and uh, we'll try to stay in under 60 seconds today as well. <laughs> and the last but not least is Marco Sensori, uh, the chief legal officer at Kraken, one of the world's largest digital asset exchanges. I can imagine that being a lawyer representing a crypto firm, you have a lot of war stories to share with us all. I have Welcome plenty if you have time. It's a pleasure <laughs> to be here. <laughs> all right, so let's start with our first topic and some facts. And just as a background for everyone, crypto regulations in Asia's tier one financial capitals kicked off in April 2017 with Japan recognizing Bitcoin as legal property. Then it reached the shores of Hong Kong with the formal announcement of a regulatory framework for virtual asset trading platform licensing, 
by the SFC formally in late 2019, and also not to be outdone, the Singapore Payment Services Act has gone into effect earlier this year in January for the dealing of digital payment tokens, or DBT, as we affectionately call it. This trend has continued into tier two and tier three countries throughout the Asia region. It's sort of like domino toppling. It's just providing that regulatory clarity that we in the industry have all been after. So someone had actually commented to me, to, to me that yes, OSL has prepared for this journey since day one by getting a big four audit, by building our governance as a public company and continuously strengthening our compliance far beyond what is required. But what has it meant to the bottom line? When they said to me, Kenny, the money is made in the gray, not in the black and white. So there are firms still choosing them to base themselves on locations off the shore of Africa, Italy, islands in the Caribbean, and jurisdictions where there's much, much wider latitude to run your business. So it is more profitable and better for crypto firms to stay unregulated, myth or reality. Maybe Ursula, we can start with you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Well, look, yeah, look, I, I think there's no doubt that there's quick money to be made in any industry that is growing rapidly where there is uh, rampant speculation uh, and where the regulatory frameworks have not yet caught up. Uh, you know, we saw that. We saw people raising 30 million uh, US dollars in a flash uh, back in 2017 when we uh, kicked off work in this space. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was re really rapid. Same time, uh, a lot of people losing money since then, uh, class actions uh, in involved in pursuing those who have, uh, were perceived to have done the wrong thing. Uh, but really, you know, what I think we've seen recognized is that for anybody looking to, to grow a sustainable business, uh, one that grows, that scales, that accesses new markets, that can access bank accounts, uh, that can have the founders exit successfully if they want to do that, uh, really has to leverage regulation. And what I have seen is that those who have been bold in really tackling regulation head on, uh, but also working with regulators and being on the front foot with embracing that uh, next wave of regulation to help shape it, uh, have been the best off in terms of crafting a business that works. So any firm that didn't do AML and KYC, you know, years ago is struggling. Uh, any firm that is has regulatory problems in their in their history carries a lot of baggage, even when they're trying to be onboarded by an accounting or a law firm. So, you know, that is always the advice we have, irrespective of whether it's a crypto firm or a gaming firm, or frankly, someone who's looking to launch a space asset, you need to look ahead to the next wave of regulation to build that sustainable business. So, so you mentioned compliance. Maybe Henry could talk a little bit about sort of the compliance advice that you can sort of give into firms that are looking for regulation. Well, absolutely. And uh, uh, first of all, I remember very well, uh, Kenny, a couple of years ago when, you know, I used to go on panels and conferences to say that we need com we need KYC, we need AML in the crypto space. And frankly, I used to get criticized by the community. And I think now everybody realizes that this is essential if we want the industry to move to one from 1 1.0 to 2.0. We really need a, we need a proper to ensure that we're not letting terrorism financing or launder money to enter the system, uh, you know, from that perspective. The, the one thing I'll mention from regulators, Kenny, is that uh, in my experience, uh, as many of you know, I work with a number of regulators, central banks, all from crypto policy to crypto regulations. I would argue that the average regulator is way more knowledgeable on crypto than the average financial services professional. And I would even say that for many, in many cases, regulators do not get the credit they deserve uh, for the work they've been doing in the space. Uh, as you know, today, uh, according to Cambridge University, only 5% of regulators do not have somebody working on crypto internally. And I would argue that over the last 20, 18 to 24 months, now we're having actually more regulatory frameworks in, in many jurisdictions. The challenges that I'm seeing in practice right now is more on the ongoing, so on the operating side. How are we implementing these regulations? The licensing time that is taking, the operating model these regu regulators are taking. Um, you know, the biggest challenge I would argue now that we have as an ecosystem in this regular, regulatory space is actually not crypto regulations. It's actually, it may sound stupid, crypto tax. Uh, I, I really expect over the next uh, 18 to 24 months to have, we need more guidance uh, on topics like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, b borrowing and lending. We have a very, very gaps in the market right now on how do you actually tax that, how you look at crypto fund. Now we have a lot of regulations for crypto funds, uh, but a lot of the same exemptions that apply to traditional hedge funds, for example, 
has still not been in place for crypto hedge funds due to the assets they hold. So that's something I'm looking forward to have some more clarity over the next couple of months, uh, not only uh, regionally, but also globally. So Henry, just, so just, just sort of delve into that point. I mean, do you see that changing? Do you see uh, regu uh, regulators or also maybe countries sort of thinking that, you know, there is money to be made here, you know, instead of, you know, instead of trying to beat them, we join them and we tax them. You know, that's what, that's how, that's how countries think, right? So what kind of, what sort of tax regulations should we expect maybe on in the coming future? Uh, yeah, first of all, they put a very basic point. I think many of the, it, you know, just because we're trading crypto and we believe crypto is not uh, is not outside of the, the tax world, let's put it that way, right? And of course, for sure, a lot of jurisdictions will come actually and put some uh, uh, tax clarity around it. The benefit, I would argue, in one case is once you have tax clarity, it also solves a lot of other problems that we've had recently where some have been saying that crypto is not even an asset class, for example, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I really believe this is something that needs to be done at the same level, at the same extent that we've had firms best practice firms like many uh, many of them are speaking at this conference and others in the ecosystem who have led by example try to comply with the applicable regulatory frameworks we're going to have the same kind of compliance being done on the fiscal side as well and i think that's something that we need to do not only uh, um, uh, because it's it's the it's the, what we need to do but also i think that's where a lot of institutional investors will invest not only when they're investing in a crypto fund they look at not only investment due diligence but something that many people forget is the operational due diligence side, which is something that any fund or business will need to fund, will need to pass in order to get that institutional capital. And whether you like it or not, uh, uh, tax compliance is, uh, falls within that as well. Just to add to that point, actually, in Singapore, there was a tax moratorium passed on digital assets uh, early, early last yeah. year. So, you know, so these are some of the things that the governments are thinking well in advance. And maybe, Marco, over to you, since, you know, your firm, your firm is... Uh, firmly chose regulation, what would you say to someone that said, you know, it's far more profitable to stay unregulated? Absolutely it is, without question. These these were great responses, by the way. <laughs> Ursula and Henry, uh, tremendous responses. I thought they were they were filled with facts and an and accurate analysis, but um, the cold, hard, demonstrable reality is that um, outrageous offensive profits have been made uh, by unregulated businesses. Those profits continue to be made by unregulated businesses and they continue to outstrip the profits made by regulated businesses. Full stop, there is no credible argument over that. The credible argument comes, so I think where Ursula and uh, Henry were focusing on the future tense. Where will the money be made in the future. Um, I happen to believe that, um, the, uh, as I think Henry and Ursula do, that the doors are closing uh, on, yeah. um, on, on that very long hallway uh, of profitability for unregulated activity. Um, but they have not closed yet. No question, they have not closed yet. I, before I was at um, Kraken uh, and before I was at blockchain.com, where I, I was the president and chief legal officer. I was a partner at Cooley, which is a major global law firm. I led the FinTech team at Cooley globally. I was a partner at Pillsbury before that, um, where I led the blockchain technology team, also a major global law firm. If there's anything that taught me, it was, uh, it was one from the slice, the sort of very broad slice across the industry that I was able to uh, have a good viewpoint into. Um, and it was that those who can successfully evade, evade, not just avoid, <laughs> but actually evade regulation, have minted untold amounts of profit. Um, I do believe those doors are closing. And now having worked on the company side, after telling people for years and years and years, look, you have to follow the law unless the law doesn't apply to you, right? And then we have to figure out where that line is drawn, and that's why people pay high quality counsel. Um, now, once I moved to uh, the company side, right, you start to see as time marches on and the windows start shutting and the doggy doors start shutting and the real doors start shutting, um, how much time and effort is spent in thinking about and figuring how to avoid uh, regulation. I don't deal personally in people who evade regulation and I never have. Mm -hmm but it is an untold amount of time 
of, of wheel spinning, of sophistry and, in, and intellectual uh, acrobatics that people undergo within crypto companies to figure out how to deliver a product in an unregulated way. And you have to weigh that, being on the inside as I am as chief legal officer, against the real business costs that all of those mental acrobatics uh, require. That is time, that is money, that is effort, that is loss of speed to market. At the end of the day, um, I think that um, by and large, if you can offer a product in an unregulated way today, you're not going to be offering it in that, in, in that unregulated way for a very long. Mm. So, the, so the window is closing, but I guess what that means to your counterparts is that you guys actually have, actually have spent the time on that due diligence. Do you, do you see them valuing that in, in that way? Okay. Absolutely. And I'll say that, look, if, if, if you are seeking registration, if you are seeking licensure, if you're seeking uh, regulation of any kind for a product that does not require it, chances are you're wasting money. Chances are you're not turning a profit that you could be turning. Perhaps one day, that extra regulation will pay off. Maybe it'll pay off today because it makes a bank partner happy, because it makes uh, another financial services partner happy. That's valuable. In, in a strict mercenarial sense, that, that is very valuable. Um, but you know, at the same time, you, you just can't leave money on the table. This is a highly competitive environment. Making the right decision means making the decision that, that follows the law and also accounts for the appetite, the risk appetite, of your business partners. And oftentimes those are the real regulators, the risk appetites of your business partners, mm -hmm. not what the government has to say. Yeah. yeah. Ur Ur Ursula, you want to add something? Uh, look, I, I, what I was going to say is that um, I, I do see a lot of advisors in our space often either not take a position at all uh, because they're not willing to wade into the gray area with their clients. Uh, and really navigate the way through because there often is a way through, you know, even if we're looking at some of the most highly regulated or restricted markets, mainland China, South Korea, you know, we see law firms and, and frankly, even we've seen this in the US, you know, a lot of counsels stopping issuing any sort of opinion, providing a verbal guidance note only. And to be in that position where you cannot even receive advice, risk-based advice from an advisor is, is, is I think, a great disservice to the industry. So, you know, what, what I see most often in terms of good advice and, uh, you know, a good play is that, yes, wade into the grey, take a look at what's possible, what's not, what's the sentiment of the regulator, and then understand where the red fla flags are to know where the tide's turning. So if we look at, say, mainland China, if you were operating offshore, purely offshore, there's some incidental business that comes out of mainland China, that's not necessarily going to get you into the same sort of trouble as if you were onshore. And some firms are willing to navigate the risks and they just wanna know where those actual risks are. And they want to know that when do they need to pay a different or take a different approach if there is a change in view. So I think it really is the responsibilities of those who are providing the tools for the industry uh, to be able to wade into that and help clients navigate it. Nurse, yeah. do you see the landscape to be more favorable in Asia in, in terms of regulatory? Do you know, I think what's happening um, now is 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 a good thing. Uh, we are seeing more regulation, but we are seeing pretty, uh, you know, tailored responses to risk. Uh, we're seeing uh, certainly uh, the need for uh, regulation around AML and KYC. We always knew that was coming, it's coming down from the Financial Action Task Force. That's going to happen globally. Um, but we're starting to see also some intelligent, uh, you know, design of regulation around things like what good custody uh, looks like, what uh, is sorts of controls through the exchange, uh, you know, e exchange ecosystem need to be implemented. I do worry that there is to some degree overkill. And when we see markets starting to restrict access to the average person, that becomes problematic as well. Likewise, when you start to see a level of regulation in certain markets that effectively just push people out. We have the same issue when you have too hard uh, regulation around banking, moves people into shadow banking, and that's no good for 
for systemic uh, considerations. So I, I, I do think Asia is creating an environment that is still welcoming, uh, you know, to to uh, to virtual assets. Um, we also see the offshore market. So Bermuda came in uh, really coming to the party, so to speak, to create a sensible regulation that gives people some certainty and clarity. Yeah, talking about that certainty and clarity, uh, just two days ago, there was a big news in Estonia you know, where they actually canceled the, the cryptocurrency license for 500 firms mm -hmm. due to a money laundering issue of $220 billion. You know, this is something that wasn't tied specifically to crypto, but these are firms that are choosing regulations that at the same time, they're, 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 being, they're being tarnished with the, with, the, with the same brush. Mm -hmm. Henry, what would you say to a firm that actually said, I'm doing everything right, I'm getting my, I'm getting my license, I'm getting regulations, but everyone, everyone's pushing me out at the same time and putting me along with everyone else? Well, it, you know, the uh, on that uh, news item from Estonia, I think it's very interesting where it was related to AML. I think the, the biggest, what keeps me up at night in our ecosystem today is that we find out tomorrow morning there's a big incident of money laundering or terrorism financing that happened by ecosystem or by some market participants who were grossly negligent and letting some of these money being laundered. I think the risk that that could cause to our ecosystem uh, because that could cause damages that will, that will slow down some of the developments that many of us and others have been working on with this regulatory clarity policy and openness to the industry. Uh, that's what actually keeps, you know, really, uh, I'm afraid from that perspective. That being said, uh, as we all know, and I think anybody listening to this uh, uh, video session knows, obviously I would argue that the, the risk that we have with cryptocurrencies because of traceability and other tools that we have, just because of the nature of the asset class that we have, obviously uh, I would argue the a lot of the players in the industry have probably better KYC AML than <laughs> arguably a lot of the traditional players, just because of traceability tools we have, and so on and so forth. That being said, uh, you know, the, the the I think the risk that we have some of the players who either t historically or now voluntarily are not uh, complying with some of these best practices we have the, around the world that could cause actually pretty big harm in the ecosystem uh, if these are not remediated uh, in the foreseeable future. Sure, sure. And, and it feels like some of these standards that are being raised have emboldened some of the some of the, some of the countries to offer you know uh, their own digital currency like CBDCs. You know, a strong example is the digital yuan. You know, they're already being piloted in several Chinese cities, where if the super fast adoption of digital payments like Alipay, WePay is any indication, we're going to have another success story here. So when CBDCs are launched, everyone will use it, adopt it, and fall in love with it. Myth or reality? What do you, what do you think, Henry? What's wrong with you? Well, you know, uh, if I put my professor hat for a second, right, obviously I've been spending a lot of time on CBDCs. The one thing, obviously, we're very early days. I think the example Alipay and the other uh, tech platforms, and actually from WhatsApp in Brazil to others in India, it, payments generally work well in a one country. You know, generally they may not be perfect, but they're okay. Obviously, the problem happens when we're moving at the cross-border level today. Uh, today, as you know, uh, there's about the uh, average fee of cross-border payments is around 7%. There's about uh, 500 billion they are sent every year from about 250 million migrants. And that's something potentially that a lot of obviously central banks are looking at it. To be, to be honest, the biggest development we had on the conversational central bank digital currency, again, whether we like it or not, was Libra. I always say in the crypto ecosystem, we should all send a bouquet of flowers to Mark Zuckerberg to thank him for having brought this topic on, pack on, that, on top of the agenda of policymakers. And obviously, there's different models that are being created now. There's a two-tier system that the, uh, the, the Swedish proposed in 2020, that Chinese are actually adopting as well, that U.S. actually with Chris Giancarlo uh, with a digital dollar, which is we use existing banking system and kind of disrupts or doesn't disrupt depending if you have a account or token based model. The second model, which is what we call a synthetic CBDC, which is what the IMF is proposing, which is kind of a stable coin where the, the issuer has access to central bank reserves. And the last model that is getting a lot, increasing a lot of traction is what we call the platform model, which is what the Bank of England and actually what the Swedes proposed in 2018 as well. Uh, so these different models are coming into play. A uh, couple of things. The one thing I would say is there's a lot of benefits from CBDC including financial inclusion. I think anybody who's in the U.S. right now, the 100 million checks that the, uh, that the government has to send to people to receive their financial, uh, the COVID-19 stimulus plan is a great mm -hmm. example. Uh, but I would say the hardest risks that we need to address that are not regulatory or tax or anything else, they're really monetary policy. One of them, for example, that Libra has done a great job discussing is the risk of currency substitution. If I'm able to send in two emerging markets, uh, Libra, USD, or any other stable coin, 
what is the risk that that causes, not to G10 countries, but to other smaller countries from a monetary perspective. And that, that's a debate I expect to have, to see even more in, on the policy side over the next couple of months. Right. So, 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 so Marco, this is gonna create a cornucopia of stable coin like CBDC, like like instruments that you have to start dealing with and digest for your customers. What are you gonna to say to them? How are you gonna how are you gonna get all these coins onto your platform and allow this ecosystem to thrive? I think there's a lot of work to be done outside of um, outside of Kraken first in terms of development. I think the ecosystem has to has to mature considerably. We are we like to think we're on the vanguard of these things, but at the end of the day, we respond to customers to customer demands. People want Bitcoin. We know that in the midst of unprecedented money printing um, over the last few months, we have seen our basic, most fundamental metrics, new account signups skyrocket, mm -hmm. seeing record highs. Um, we, 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 we think we know why that is, and I think most of the world knows why, why that is happening right now. Um, and it has to do with the relationship between free and open networks like Bitcoin, like most, like Ethereum, uh, like most digital currencies as we know them today, and governments whose current responsibility it is to um, to care for our financial well-being in a very direct way. That is to say, to mm -hmm. it, it, it is the care and feeding of our money supply. It's unclear whether people will want digital currencies, and if they do, for what reasons? I don't believe people will want any uh, central, I should say central bank digital currencies. I don't believe that people will want any central bank digital currency for the same reason they want existing digital currencies. It simply does not make sense. There, the, 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 the Venn diagram of those two consumer appetites looks like a pair of binoculars. They do not connect. People, are, people, I think, are right to be interested in central bank digital currencies for a number of reasons. They can make existing fiat systems much more effective, much more efficient. They can lower overall costs. Um, philosophically, there's really nothing to get excited there about. This is, this is an operator's dream. This is a consultant's dream, right? How do we implement this new system? Um, how do we rip out our old uh, heart and put in a 3D printed one? Um, as somebody from Wall Street once told me about blockchains, um, that's that's those are exciting issues. Those are that's sort of mental bubble gum. Is it going to change anything? No, no. It'll make transactions faster. It'll make transactions cheaper. Are people going to feel differently about their governments? Are they going to feel differently about their wallets? Are they going to spend money differently? No. Governments are going to be more able to monitor. Um, uh, monetary systems. Uh, they're going to be able to do it much more effectively and efficiently than they can today, which is great because they can look out for financial shocks. They can achieve the goals they set out to achieve today in a much more effective way. That's scary too, though, right? Mm -hmm. We actually, there's a lot of people who are, are I, I think, rightfully nervous about the government being uh, their their government being any better at financial surveillance than it is today, um, I think that, that even within that group, there are, there are the philosophically inclined who you know who believe there's something immoral about the government having so much um, so much of a view into our day to day financial lives. But then there are others who are just plain practical about it, and they say, look, financial regulation, particularly anti money laundering regulation, has cost more than it's saved. If you look at the breakdown by headcount of banks. Um, and how much is dedicated to compliance. Presumably those people might actually um, like what, what CBDCs can do because of that um, panopticon layer that might obviate the need for, that, for those kinds of compliance mechanisms. They could save a lot of people a lot of money. But like, let's not confuse that for consumer demand. That sounds like bank demand. That sounds like financial services demand, like Wall Street demand. We still have yet to see whether our users want that stuff. I look forward to finding out. Yeah, that does, that's a great point. So, so final round of questions. Um, what is the reality that we're facing beyond regulations? Or if I could channel my inner Henry, 
what is the one thing that we know about need to know about the future of crypto? Maybe I'll start with you, Ursula. Yeah, well, look, I, I think the story is far beyond the institutionalization of Bitcoin. Yes, that's an important question, but really we're talking about the transformation of money, we're trans the transformation of our financial markets, but also really um, we're now at the frontier of uh, that co competition between financial crime, uh, compliance, regulation, oversight, surveillance, um, and uh, privacy. And I think those two, that is the battleground that we will see over the next, uh, you know, the coming months and years. Um, and it is a very difficult one to follow and that will follow along political, philosophical lines. Okay. And, and Henry, one thing we need to tell? Yeah, for me, it's very, very simple as, uh, you know, it's, uh, I think this is a very exciting time in the future of money. Uh, you know, and I think we're already going through this transformation. I think COVID-19 has a lot of negative sides in, in, in people in society. I think on this topic, definitely is going to accelerate the pace. And I think we're, I think we're all, all of us are honored. I feel privileged that to be able to live and work in the space, actually the transformative era of this era. So very excited about what's coming ahead, and not only on the future of the crypto assets industry, but on the future of money and, and directly on the future of society and economic policy, which is very exciting. And Marco, you get the last word. I love it. Uh, I think we're going to see a, a power shift. Um, what we've seen over the last uh, few years has been um, a simultaneous brain drain uh, right alongside a financial drain from traditional money centers. Um, folks who uh, were in finance and caught the Bitcoin bug went into crypto. And we've seen people uh, of higher and higher ranks, more and more brass on their collars uh, doing that. And what's come along with that is a shit is a drain of cash as well. Crypto companies are becoming more powerful. They're becoming more of a voice in government. They're becoming better organized. Um, and before, you know, governments could get away just kind of ignoring the problem or giving it to Mikey, as the old American saying goes, um, I think that's going to start shifting. They're going to start seeing crypto companies influence policy in a much more direct way. Great. And I want to thank you to my panelists. Back to you, back to you Henry. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Fantastic insights from everyone. Thank you, Kenny, for your uh, your incredible moderating. Uh, basically, I guess if you buy Bitcoin, follow the rules. But, uh, you know, if you don't want to follow the rules, buy Bitcoin anyway. It's a peaceful protest. Uh, so thanks again, everyone. We will have about five minutes until our next uh, panel. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to the next panel. Uh, we will be talking about product innovations in the digital space uh, and will be moderated by Ben Tsai, the president of Wave Financial. Ben, you're up. Hi, thank, thank you very much. Uh, this is Benjamin Tsai. I'm the uh, president of Wave Financial. Uh, we're one of the two co-hosts for the event today. Uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, across the different time zones. Uh, with me today, uh, we have uh, Tim McCord, a managing director at the CME Group, uh, heading global, uh, the global head of equity products. Uh, we have uh, Wayne Trench, uh, the CEO of OSL, and we have Paul Ridley, uh, CEO of Wholesale Digital Office at uh, Nomura. And thank you very much for the three of you to join us on this panel. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, I, I think it'd be good for us to start with uh, just a quick introduction of what, what you do and your focus with regards to digital assets. Uh, Tim, can we start with you, please? Uh, sure. Thanks, Ben. And, and great to be here today. Uh, to, I'm looking forward to the conversation. So in my capacity at CME Group, I'm Global Head of Equity Index and Alternative Investment Products. So that includes be benchmark equity products such as the S&P 500, NASDAQ 100, the Dow Jones and the Russell 2000, as well as alternatives, which at CME Group. Uh, currently, we classify commodity index products as well as cryptocurrency products as part of our alternative investment product offering. Great. I, I think that that's, that's a good grouping. I, I used to run commodities for Bank of America across Asia, so that, that's always an interesting space for me. Uh, Wayne, would you like to go next, please? Sure. Thanks, Ben. Uh, also, great to be here today. Uh, Wayne Trench, I'm the CEO of OSL. Um, uh, what we believe to be Asia's leading digital asset platform. We, uh, we are a main board listed company here in Hong Kong, but with operations all around the world. We run uh, four main verticals. We have a, br a brokerage business, uh, an institutional grade exchange, uh, a custody offering, as well as a software as a service business uh, 
as I said, headquartered out of uh, Hong Kong. Great. Thank you very much. And Paul, uh, can I hand it to you for your introduction also? Sure. Uh, Paul Ridley from Nomura. Um, for anyone that's not familiar with Nomura, it is a global investment bank and uh, one of the largest and oldest securities businesses in Japan. Um, at Nomura, I sit in the digital office uh, within the investment bank, which is a group that's responsible for um, all of our uh, fintech strategy, which includes digital assets, uh, where we're active uh, at this point and interested across the value chain, probably most notably uh, at the moment uh, with an announcement yesterday uh, of a joint venture that we've been working on for some time in the custody space for digital assets called Kamainu. Uh, which just launched uh, and is really kind of the opening um, move for us in the digital asset space to take uh, digital assets and, and Bitcoin in particular uh, to our traditional clients. So, um, you know, this is an area that Nomura is very active in and will continue to be active in. Uh, and I kind of lead our efforts in Asia. Great. Thank, thank you, Paul. I've actually spent a number of hours in Tokyo with various different parts of Nomura, so I know there's a lot of activity there. Uh, very exciting. So uh, before we jump in, I think, uh, you know, one of the things that I was looking at was really uh, product innovation and thinking about how to approach this. I think as, as a good starting point, um, I think a product innovation means slightly different things to different people. And I think for all of you, there are two different types of client base that we typically look at. One is really retail, kind of re products that go to retail. And the other one is more institutional investors. And you know, me potentially being a, a client of somebody like OSL, I'm really seeing myself as an institutional client rather than me personally as, as a client to, to buy Bitcoins off of OSL's uh, you know, services. So um, would you guys like to address, you know, who the buyers are? What are they investing in? What are they looking at right now? Just to kind of set a baseline for what we talk about on the, on the product side. Um, uh, Tim, would you like to get, get started on that? Uh, sure, thanks, man. So I think when we look at uh, CME's role in the marketplace, it's not necessarily that we can comment on who the buyers are, right? Because on the futures exchange, there's a buyer and seller to every transaction. But I think we've certain seen we've certainly seen some some positive trends with respect to the customer segments being fairly balanced across both the sophisticated active individual trader, as you talked about, as well as institutions. And I think when talking about institutions, it's also important to note that we both mean traditional institutions, you know, in terms of hedge funds, asset managers, but there's also uh, plenty of institutions that are more native in the crypto space. So I think when talking about the institutional adoption, we also have to be mindful that it's probably not the traditional uh, definition of an institutional invest investor. But I think the other thing to comment in terms of who we're seeing participate in the market, what's really been great to see in the development of the, the futures and the options on futures at CME Group is that that participation is fairly balanced geographically as well. When we look at country of origin of, of the order in terms of where that order sender is domiciled or time of day, it's roughly split 50-50 uh, from both a pre a U.S. A trading hour perspective, as well as a U.S. regular trading hour perspective. So to have that almost 50, you know, that that equal split of 50-50 between U.S. and non-U.S. is certainly a great uh, development for the crypto market. And also a fairly, uh, it's an anomaly with respect to CME to have that almost equal participation, uh, both inside and outside the U.S., where other products, for example, in equities, is closer to 25%. Uh, on average. So I think that's also great, not only the who, but where uh, that flow is coming from, I think is, is of note as well. Great. Uh, Wayne, would you like to comment on that? I, I know you, you guys service probably both pools and you've also been expanding globally. on. on yeah, so I guess uh, picking up on, on, on the point that Tim made there with uh, outsized uh, participation from Asia or, 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 or uh, participants outside of the US, uh, certainly I give gives credence to the uh, to the notion that uh, Asia plays a massive role in the existing uh, crypto uh, digital asset ecosystem. Um, you know, we've been uh, in this space for uh, well, uh, by crypto standards, for uh, uh, the equivalent of decades, I guess. Um, and we've really seen an evolution of the customer base um, geographically. In fact, we've uh, we've seen kind of the other side of it, Tim, in some ways, where 
more and more of our own business is starting to emanate out of uh, you know the US and Europe and so on. But um, you know, with a really strong presence in Asia, where the bulk of liquidity still currently sits today, uh, you know, we see it. We see an outsized proportion of our of our flows uh, come from this part of the world. But as far as the types of investors, it's been a it's been a really uh, amazing evolution in many ways. You know, from the the early stage where it was uh, you know very tech savvy, uh, you know, early adopters um, who were lucky enough to get long Bitcoin in you know single digit dollars. Uh, to, uh, to 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 where we sit today, where you know, if I look at our even our onboarding, you know, if you think about three years ago, we were probably spending eighty percent of our time onboarding uh, individuals, albeit more uh, you know high net worth in nature. Uh, we're now spending probably ninety percent of our time onboarding uh, corporates, family offices, private banks, crypto funds, traditional funds, and so on. So. Um, uh, a, a significant shift towards the direction that we've certainly set ourselves up for, which is really servicing that far more institutional segment of the market. And uh, yeah, just really pleasing to see the uh, that, that evolution uh, take place the way it has. That, that's great. Yeah, I totally agree on the on the fact that things move very quickly. I've seen really product innovation in, in evolution over the past year and a half. That would probably take a decade in the traditional space, and I have spent that decade in the traditional space, and it it, it does move uh, in a very different pace. Uh, Paul, would you like to comment as you're still in a mostly traditional firm? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I guess further to what other people have said, I think that early on in the digital asset space, a lot of the product innovation was around um, solving problems that would help um, individual investors get into digital assets. Um, most of those kind of fiat on ramps, for example, um, entry products, exchanges, and so on already exist. Um, but what we're starting to see now um, really accelerate is uh, the innovation that allows traditional institutions um, like ourselves and our clients um, get into the space. And so, um, you know, what that has kind of opened up is uh, really the first wave of early adopting institutions, uh, which are the same ones that are early adopters of other asset classes. So um, the more forward looking hedge funds who are trading a small kind of two to 5% um, side pocket portfolio in um, obscure commodities, for example, um, are coming into digital assets or, or expressing an interest. Um, some of the family offices that have a new generation that is just starting to exert some influence on an investment committee uh, are coming in and saying, hey, you know, how are we not invested in Bitcoin? You know, I can't go on Bloomberg without seeing articles on that. You know, let's get involved. Um, that's what we're, we're seeing a lot of now um, and increasingly so. Um, less so the traditional institutions who uh, might be endowments and foundations and pensions who are the last to adopt everything. Um, don't see them coming in at all, uh, but you know, eventually the innovation that we are seeing um, will get to their doorstep as well. Yeah, I'm a little disappointed to, to hear that, uh, but uh, basically with, uh, with a lot of the endowments, I think they do have the capacity to try some of these things. They have a long timeline and, and they are able to take the type of risk for this. Uh, and uh, you know, I would love for them to jump in and do more. I used to do alternatives with them. They invest in all sorts of stuff. It's not like they're shy. So it's a disappointment they haven't dived, uh, you know, jump headfirst into this. So uh, just to kind of drill in a little bit more on the institutional side, I think one of the big concepts right now that is kind of in development is prime brokerage and the idea of having prime brokerage within, uh, you know, the, the new cryptocurrency asset class. We're now seeing Coinbase buying uh, Tagomi. We're seeing uh, you know, Genesis buying Vault in Europe, and I think everybody's trying to put pieces together to try to get to a a, a prime brokerage perspective. I, I'm just curious as to what your views on that are, and, and do you find that to be a product innovation for the institutional clients? Uh, well, we'll start with Wayne. I think Wayne has has the most pieces on this board for this uh, conversation. Yeah, sure. The prime is uh, is certainly the latest buzzword in uh, in crypto circles, but I think for us it was a journey that we started. Uh, probably close to three and a half years ago. Um, you know, most of our team, uh, or a lot of our team come out of traditional financial institutions and uh, and are very aware and familiar um, with what having a robust prime offering can offer to customers. 
Um, you know, it makes accessing markets easier. Um, it offers investors a much more efficient way to deploy capital. And also, um, I guess in the, in the current state of the crypto ecosystem, uh, it offers a way for the more institutional investors to reduce their risk profile as far as counterparty risk goes. Um, but even technology risk, you know, like uh, a lot of the venues that are currently, uh, um, you know, traded on in the market, obviously uh, a lot remain unregulated, but also from a technology perspective, there may be issues or changes that are hard for a, a more institutional sized firm to, uh, uh, to consume and, and, and move with. Um, so a prime offering helps alleviate all of, all, all of those uh, things. It's also a good business to be in, you know, um, you know, as far as um, traditional investment banks go, uh, the prime uh, prime part of the business is, uh, is certainly one of the more uh, profitable uh, parts uh, of, of certainly the businesses I've been involved in, in the past. And there there clearly is a, a appetite um, for the for the, the newer, um, more traditional firms entering this space to, to, to operate using a mechanism that they know well and feel comfortable with. And so that's something we continue to evolve um, with respect to offering uh, coin borrow lending, for example, or, uh, or over the counter uh, derivatives um, uh, and, and so on. So uh, there's lots and lots of demand. And I, I do think that it does take the right DNA to be able to get that product to market safely, uh, securely, um, and with the right uh, risk controls. You know, there's a lot of technology uh, firms out there who are, who are trying to uh, to put this uh, in the hands of customers, but may, may not have the battle scars that everybody on this call has <laughs> from uh, from time gone go, gone by. Yeah, so we we offer uh, treasury services and wealth management services to institutionals and high net worth, and we would love to have a proper prime brokerage on the back end to support us. So certainly, I'm very excited to see all the progress that a lot of the firms have made, and you know, we we certainly work with OSL, we work with other firms. Uh, Paul, would you like to comment on this? I know Nomura is active in the traditional prime brokerage space. I'm curious as to you know whether there are thoughts given to this direction. Yeah, so so there have been, and I guess from my perspective, in the crypto markets, a lot of the innovation and and the you know Tagomis of the world and so on have approached prime um, by solving the same problems that prime sets out to solve. For example, um, improving liquidity and so on. Um, but by using technology to, you know, pool liquidity across exchanges and improve order execution and so on. And, you know, for us, um, yes, you know, that is valuable and it's something that, that needs to be done. But at the same time, um, a lot of those problems could also be solved just by incorporating digital assets into existing um, prime brokerage services. So, you know, if we, Nomura or any of the other big prime brokers said tomorrow uh, to all of their prime brokerage clients, by the way, uh, we can add Bitcoin, we can add Libra, you know, we can add Ethereum to the to our existing terms and conditions. Um, you know, I think you'd see a huge uptick in in activity. And so, you know, the, the two sides, the tech side and the traditional prime side, I think are slowly going to converge. Um, both sorts of changes are necessary and will drive volume, uh, but we won't really get there in, until you see uh, both sides of that coin, you know, really getting involved. Yeah, it's really interesting to have both of you on the call because I think Wayne is uh, approaching it from the, we'll build it from scratch with people who are experienced. And I think Paul, from your side, it's, we have the existing platform. How do we add the capability as an expansion? And I'm a big believer in, you know, uh, crypto being bolted onto an investment bank as just the next asset class. I feel like that was how commodities was added a few years ago. And, and now the next thing would probably just be crypto bolted onto an investment bank, another few deaths on the trading floor. So, Tim, what are your thoughts on this from more of the exchange perspective? Are, are you seeing more people who are accessing you through kind of prime brokers? Do you find that to help uh, your business? Well, I think in general, uh, you know, I've said in, in some other conferences and things as well, I think the the advent of prime services or prime brokers in crypto will certainly be a catalytic event. I think the idea of even the way we designed our contract at CME Group is the more we can make these products plug and play with 
those type of transactional services or the transactional handshakes that customers and participants are already familiar with that will only make it easier, more approachable, and eventually even more successful. Uh, so I think that's what's really important to note here is that this continued evolution is this is making the market a more and more robust ecosystem. This is not necessarily just about the spot trading of crypto or the mining of crypto you're having you know, from CME's perspective, the advent of uh, robust futures and options markets on Bitcoin, uh, as well as some additional reference rates on Ether. You know, when we look at this, it's really the idea of an OTC market for derivatives alongside a listed derivatives market, alongside the borrow lending market that Wayne was talking about. These are all central tenants of a highly efficient symbiotic and interrelated ecosystem. And I think that's what people are looking for in terms of that next wave of adoption or where we get that next, you know, kind of those people who are watching from the institutional space, but not necessarily entering yet. I think that will go a long way. Uh, especially when we're looking at something like Prime. And that's what we've seen at CME Group. You know, when we have our Bitcoin future CME Group is financially settled to the Bitcoin reference rate. It plugs and plays in our systems and our clearing member systems and the trading systems the same way an S&P 500 and index future does. So making it easy for people to get involved has certainly been, I think, a, a central tenet to the success to date and will certainly be, I think, a driving force for the innovation to come. Uh, in the next months and years. That's great. Thank, thank you for that. I, I think that that's a great overview. Oh, Tim. Oh, okay. So there's a, there's a time, slight time delay on okay. your video versus your audio. Yeah. So um, just a, a just kind of switching gears a little bit. You know, if we look at more of the the retail side, at the, the end user of our products and so forth. Uh, I, I think, you know, one uh, discussion that we were having was, you know, how much education we should have and what type of products we're able to provide. Uh, can we kind of get into a little bit more about that? Where, where, What are you seeing as innovative products are coming to the market that can potentially, you know, uh, be consumed by retail? Uh, Wayne, should we start with yeah, you Yeah, sure. I mean, I, like we, we generally don't service what we would call the retail end of the market, right? Like, uh, the individuals sure, yeah. that we service would be uh, sort of uh, accredited investor sort of status uh, in general in general terms. But um, look, there's there's certainly there's been um, a real uh, uplift in in product innovation uh, over the last couple of years. And um, the interesting thing, though, for us is that it, it's a playbook that we kind of understand well, right? It's uh, we're following uh, in many ways what we're all familiar with in traditional asset classes and the types of products that that the uh, traditional head funds require are now starting to come to market. Um, I do think one of the big changes though, is that there's been a real changing of the guard uh, begin to take place. Whereas, you know, we started with, and, and there remains to be uh, um, numerous uh, unregulated uh, markets uh, about, that provide uh, leverage swap products or futures and so on. We're seeing a general uh, shift towards uh, more institutional platforms, more institutional players like uh, ourselves, like CME, Nomura and so on. Like, I think the, you know, the, the options of growth, uh, Tim, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's 10X or more in pretty, in pretty short order. Um, the futures open interest is, uh, is significantly uh, higher. I think, you know, we, we too are seeing that, right? You know, uh, with, uh, with our own growth uh, in volumes across the platform, um, largely on the back of a, a very institutional uh, strategy. Um, as far as the products themselves, you know, we've, we've had, uh, we, we're now seeing, um, uh, you know, structured products uh, gather a lot more interest and, and swaps, um, you know, on, in addition to the coin uh, borrow lending um, that I mentioned before. Um, and, you know, you, as Tim rightly pointed out before, you require all of those sorts of products for an efficient um, marketplace in our view particularly for sophisticated investors to, to get involved. Um, and it's another point of friction uh, that is removed uh, to allow them to sort of uh, uh, get involved in the space. We have to remember, right, that a lot of the, uh, the IMs for these traditional hedge funds uh, don't allow them to be uh, more than X percent long or short or any, any direction or, or maintain uh, naked positions long or short, um, you know. So the advent of the CME futures, which as uh, as Tim has pointed out, is has been put together in a way 
uh, that's easy for the traditional um, participants to consume. It looks and feels like what they used to uh, has really helped that. And I think um, for you know way, the way that applies for us is similar in the over counter over the counter products. Um, it's not strange or, or unusual the way they're structured. We have an ISDA like uh, sort of um, a set of terms and conditions that people are comfortable with and understand. And then even from a technology perspective, right? You need people need to be able to connect into these products using fix, for example, or co-location. And we need to have things like transaction monitoring and market surveillance to be able to uh, engage with these more uh, traditional uh, and institutional participants. So I think there's in innovation on the actual product self its side, but there's also been innovation in the infrastructure uplift um, to allow uh, you know, the more material participants to enter and participate in the space. Great. <clears throat> thank, thank you for that. Tim, would you like to add to that in terms of innovation on your side with regards to either on the institutional infrastructure side or also on the more mass offering? I, 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 Wayne, I agree with you. I think my, my term of retail is probably a little bit too wide. I think the current focus for most people is probably more you know, high net worth, accredited investor space. It's unfortunate, but it's the reality as we're, we're bound by a lot of the regulations that are associated with that. So Tim, please. Yeah, for sure. And I think when we're looking at the the innovation at CME Group, I think the one thing that's always interesting from our perspective is, you know, CME Group is, is nearly a 180 year old institute. We started as a, a butter and eggs exchange, right on the, on the streets of Chicago. And now we're offering cryptocurrency futures, right? So I think there's a, a long storied history of innovation where we have products, uh, futures and options across all major investable asset classes now, including crypto. And this is an asset class that didn't even exist 10 years ago, right? Or a little over 10 years ago. Uh, but I think for us, the innovation is it's about being measured and how can we balance uh, our desire to innovate with our ability to build the highly efficient, trusted and transparent markets for price discovery. So that's why we really started back in November of 2016 with introducing the Bitcoin reference rate uh, with our partner crypto facility. And that was kind of the first step is getting people to believe or ascribe to the value of Bitcoin in dollar on a daily basis, such that we could then structure products around that reference rate. And we launched futures in December of 2017. Uh, you know, which Wayne has said, you know, doing fantastic, doing the equivalent of about 42,000 Bitcoin per day here in 2020. And then, you know, we always wanted to introduce options, but to introduce options on futures, first you need a robust underlying futures market. Uh, so in January of this year, we were, came, we were finally able to introduce the options. We're doing great, about 2,500 Bitcoin uh, per day, you know, with the, the record of about just a little bit, I think around between eight and 9,000 uh, a week or two ago. So the, the volume growth is great. The demand is there. And we're always innovating in response to clearly articulated customer demand, but it's doing so in a way that again, is kind of measured and we can balance the, the wanting to innovate and wanting to deliver these products to the marketplace, but to make sure they can do so in a successful way. And then in a way that people are accustomed to when managing their risks or accessing the markets at CMA. Great, okay. Uh, Paul, kind of go over to you. I, I know uh, you know the, the custodial business that you mentioned previously is a, is a big addition to the the field, and I, I'm actually you know I, I welcome you guys coming into the custody space. I'm actually quite excited by that. So uh, you know, would you like to comment more there, or any other kind of infrastructure or product uh, improvements? Yeah, sure. So I, I think that a lot of the the sort of changes um, in evolution that's going to be seen. Uh, for retail and for the institutional side, it is less so around what the actual new products are going to be, uh, new wrappers, that sort of thing, um, but more so around where it's coming from, who's offering it, uh, and how easy it is to access. And so, um, you know, my personal view is that you're going to see a lot more traditional instit institutions like Nomura, uh, like CME, like Fidelity, TD Ameritrade, and so on. Um, offering these products through their existing channels um, to their existing clients, whether that's retail or not, um, in a way that will be light years more kind of accessible and easier to um, to kind of dip a toe in um, for all kinds of investors. Our uh, joint venture uh, custody business, Kamini, that I mentioned before, is one example of that. Um, we're working on a handful of other projects in the digital asset space, uh, similar uh, you know, to, to that as well, um, that will kind of bring different parts of the value chain 
um, in front of our existing clients in ways that you know they haven't been offered them before. Um, and you know, another example of that is uh, Libra, uh, where you know people will be able to hold digital currencies uh, and buy them from their retail banks. Um, I think you know the impact that that's going to have on the space overall uh, can't be overestimated, and it's something that you know is really going to contribute to the growth of the whole ecosystem. Great, Th thank you for that. And uh, you know, I've I've been prompted to that we actually need to kind of start wrapping up. So. Uh, I'll throw out a final question for all of you. Uh, I think this is actually one of the questions that was asked in the chat group, and it's a very general question, uh, which is, when do you see digital securities take off? And I, actually, I was thinking about how I would answer that, and I, I think it's it, it depends on what that specifically references to. So before I kind of set that in stone for anybody, I'll, I'll just leave it open. Uh, well, Tim, we'll start with you. Do you want to kick off on what your thoughts are there and and how you see you know, your definition of digital securities taking off? Yeah, well, I mean, I think from the, the futures perspective and futures on digital assets, I think we're already, they're already taking off at CME, which has been great to see. It's been a lot of fun to work on. Uh, hard for me to predict the future of where we'll go from here. I think if I could do that, I'd have a, an even different <laughs> job, uh, but certainly exciting and looking forward to see what's next and, and really happy to be part of it. It's been a lot of fun the last few years working on, working on in cryptocurrency and building these Great. Products. And and Wayne, I, I think for, for your firm, you guys have been in that space for a while and have done quite well. So I, I think, you know, it's probably an easier answer for you. When do you think, you know, digital securities will take off from your perspective in a, in a much more massive sense than what you're doing right now? Yeah, um, look, uh, you know, regulation is probably the big one. If we're talking about uh, tokenized equities or debt, you know, sort of type instruments, right? And uh, fortunately for us, uh, you know, being headquartered here in Hong Kong, uh, the, the, the SFC's uh, um, guidance uh, around their virtual asset uh, licensing framework uh, not only uh, requires successful license holders to uh, not, not only allows them to trade security tokens, um, but in fact, we'll enforce uh, you know participants to uh, to trade security tokens. So, um, you know, as and when the the licensing uh, the, the SFC does issue licenses to uh, to successful uh, holders, I think that will be a big step forward um, in the uh, in the uptake of, of security token offerings. Is with one of the world's uh, preeminent regulators really getting behind it and and putting a proper structure in place. Um, we are seeing other jurisdictions around the world, though, uh, move in that uh, in that direction as well. Um, but I think the technology is is there, right? It's it, it's not like uh, we're waiting for to see whether the technology is there or whether the demand is there. The ICO craze of a few years ago will show that the demand and the ability to raise um, extraordinary amounts of capital quickly through through technology is uh, is, is doable. Um, you know, it's uh, it's now down to the regs, and that is. Uh, we, we, we are hopeful that's quite imminent uh, in this part of the world. Great. Yeah, you mentioned the, the STO world, which is really near and dear to my heart. And uh, it's, uh, it's unfortunate we're going to run out of time to get into that topic. That could be hours and hours of discussion. I know you guys are also applying for a license in Hong Kong. We wish you the best of luck there. Thank you. Uh, Paul, would you like to comment on that, uh, you know, in terms of when you think it's going to take off? I know the STO space is actually pretty hot in Japan right now. And, uh, you know, we're actually a member of the JSTA and, you know, we're in actively involved in that space. So we'd, we'd love to hear and hear your views on that. Yeah, sure. So, you know, I guess building on, on what we've heard from Tim and Wayne, um, we share the view that, that digital securities and security tokens are the future. Um, they they will arrive and they will replace uh, traditional securities such as sort of we've traded them over the last hundred years. Um, with that said, there are a lot of pieces that need to be put in place um, before that's going to be possible at scale. Um, certainly you need the technology. I think a lot of the technology is pretty far along at this point, uh, or at least far enough along uh, to get, get out of the gate. Um, you need the regulatory environment, which is probably not quite there completely, but moving in the right direction. Um, you need uh, the banks and traditional issuers uh, to be able to offer digital securities at scale. Uh, you know, ultimately, for me, I think that you know these products can't really take off until you have a big global bank say, actually, um, you know, if you want you know, to be part of this next bond offering, 
um, it's going to be digital. Um, that's the way, you know, it's going to be issued. And, you know, here's how you can do it. Take it or leave it. Um, at that point, uh, I think that the tide starts to turn. Um, but you can't really take that first step until every step along the value chain is sorted out. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately, that does take quite a while. Um, you know, I think that we're, you know, probably five to 10 years from, you know, the beginning of that of that wave. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think we'll see how it goes from there. Um, with that said, as we know uh, from watching crypto for a number of years, the tide can turn very quickly. Uh, and that's what we're preparing for now. That, that's great. I, I, I agree with everything you've said, except the five to 10 years part. I, I don't have five to 10 years to wait for that. So I'm hoping it'll happen a lot sooner. Uh, not not as a plug, uh, just uh, too much of a plug for myself, but we're working on products that would go through the security token uh, landscape. I mean, the thing I'm working on right now is actually a whiskey fund, which I've talked about before. So, you know, I, I really, truly believe that, uh, you know, we, we can take advantage of the existing regulations legally and compliantly to get things going. And, uh, you know, over on top of that, we can get a, a fund going. We're doing tokenization of crypto. We're doing tokenization of whiskey. We're, we're doing quite a number of things. And I believe that that's already legal. I do agree with you. No major bank has said, yes, we want to sell your whiskey fund yet. So I'm still waiting for that. So if anybody knows any major banks, let me know. And, uh, you know, happy to have this chat. So. I'll wrap it up here. Thank you very much for your time today. It has been uh, very informative. I'm, I'm seeing some of the message on chat. I believe everybody has all is all very appreciative also. Henry, I'll hand this back to you. Great, fantastic panel. Thank you so much for your insights. Thank you so much for being here. Um, you know, as you guys have noted, these are incredibly tool, uh, incredibly important tools for the maturation of this space. Uh, and as Ben told you, you know, you all have your marching orders. We're not going to wait five or 10 years. Uh, it needs to be now, now, now. So go off and, uh, and please give us the tools we need. And thank you so much. Um, we will have about five minutes until our next event, which will be uh, a fireside chat with Dave Olson of Jump Trading. So we will see you then. Thank you. OK, hello, everyone. So we are back with uh, Ian uh, Sterling from OSL, who will be moderating a fireside chat with Dave Olson of Jump Trading. Thank you, Henry. I think over the course of uh, our time together today, we've had the opportunity to hear about the rapid growth of the sector, about regulations and expanding product shelf. I think it's really fitting to punctuate our forum with the tale from curiosity to experiment and ultimately into market leader through the experiences of, of our next speaker. And so it's a great pleasure and a delight to introduce Dave Olson. Uh, Dave had a storied career with JP Morgan before moving over to proprietary trading firm Jump Trading where he's currently the president and chief risk officer. Whilst he didn't make the jump for digital assets, he's been instrumental in leading the firm's uh, foray into that space. And I think, uh, I hope at least from the session, you'll be able to identify with a number of the uh, steps that Dave has taken as you embark on or continue your own journeys to digital asset discovery or adoption. So good evening, Dave, and thank you for joining us. I think uh, like all good stories, it makes sense to start from the beginning. So maybe you can uh, offer some color around your transition to jump, a little bit about the business and uh, the nature of what spawned the curiosity into digital assets and ultimately into experimentation phase. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Ian, uh, and to the entire group. I'm really happy to be a part of this uh, this evening here in New York and whatever time it is. Uh, morning predominantly in Hong Kong and, and everyone else that's dialed in. So uh, really, really thrilled to be a part of this. Uh, yeah, I've been at Jump uh, about four years now. And I, uh, when I arrived in 2016, uh, uh, you're, you're quite right. Uh, I wasn't drawn to uh, Jump because of what was happening in digital assets. Um, uh, I was more drawn to uh, the the company that I had grown to know during my time at JP Morgan, uh, the management team, how they 
uh, behaved in both good times and in crises, uh, and what was happening with um, uh, the real move toward uh, data science and using uh, much more sophisticated modeling tools uh, to predict value in financial markets. Um, but it so happened that uh, just as I was arriving at Jump, um, we were incubating uh, a, uh, in what was more or less a talent development program that we had initiated in collaboration with the University of Illinois, uh, a chance for uh, students there and uh, potential prospects to work at Jump to build out infrastructure and, and model high performance gateways and sessions with a lot of the burgeoning cryptocurrency exchanges around the world. The thinking then being, you know, the this was when uh, Bitcoin was still triple digits. There wasn't enough volume to really get on our radar screen, screen as an institution. Uh, it was an incredibly fragmented market built by very creative entrepreneurs. Uh, these are all the exchanges and marketplaces where you could trade digital assets at that time. Um, but none of them really had the same toolbox that had been used in modern financial markets. So our thinking was, you take this young talent, have them cut their teeth on developing uh, high performance connectivity to these venues with all of their idiosyncr idiosyncratic requirements. And if they uh, ever came to work at Jump and they had to use um, you know, modern fixed tools and uh, exchange protocols, it would, uh, it would be a piece of cake. Um, little did we know that we were, uh, we were wiring together, uh, a, a level of global connectivity, uh, that just a few months later would become incredibly interesting and incredibly valuable to us. Um, so it was, uh, uh, I, I won't call it entirely an accident, uh, but it certainly wasn't part of some long-term vision that we decided to invest all these hours in, uh, in developing these capabilities. That's quite interesting that really the origins were not necessarily preserving your market leading edge in the prop trading side of the business, but it was, a much, it was about uh, retaining staff and, and good talent on that front. So clearly the market leadership position did not come up just overnight, um, but through this experimentation, or at least scratching the itch on the curiosity, going into experimentation, and you recognize that you're onto something, and that whilst you're in green fields, this is when the trailblazing begins. Maybe you can share a little bit about that um, that experience, especially when you think back to those years. Um, there is no playbook, there is no manual for you to follow. You have to really create your own framework around compliance, risk, operations, etc. Yeah, those were uh, those were pretty exciting days, and that was that was when uh, you had a lot of value discrepancy between venues. Uh, you had a very broken movement of fiat around the world. Uh, you had a lot of correspondent clearing banks abruptly shut down some of the fiat rails uh, with no notice. Uh, you had uh, you had behavior where you would send an order. You would then send a cancellation of that order. You'd get an acknowledgement of the cancellation back, and then you'd get a fill for the same order. And you think, you know, what, what in the world is going on here? Uh, it was very unfamiliar uh, relative to the to most of the markets that we uh, that we participate in. Um, but we really had a dual objective back then. I think, of course, we wanted to follow our nose to where the opportunity was, uh, try to make money, and uh, and and trade in as liquid a way as possible. Um, but, you know, you bring up compliance and, and, and trying to, to construct a framework where one didn't really exist. We made a, uh, a second distinction that we wanted to make sure that our behavior, even if permissible under the letter of the law or because a regulation had not yet been written, was not gonna be uh, adversely affecting the entire ecosystem. Uh, so privacy tokens are a good example of that. There's a lot of buzz around Monero when it first came out. Uh, it looked like it was going to be uh, certainly a top 10 coin and maybe on its way uh, to even higher levels. Uh, and we took a stance as a company that uh, even though we might uh, 
uh, we might be able to stake a claim and, and become a top liquidity provider in a privacy token, it was worth foregoing whatever revenue would accrue to us from that uh, while the regulatory landscape for that sort of uh, instrument had just not been uh, not been formulated and you had the potential for something to go pretty wrong. Um, even though we had counsel suggest, no, you're, you've got a credible defense if it ever came to that uh, because there's, there's really no specific reg around this. We tried to, uh, we tried to play a longer term game uh, and not, uh, not cut, cut the market out uh, at the knees um, while we were, we were trying to build a business. Um, <clears throat> I'd say the other big distinction back in those days uh, was uh, we weren't, we weren't overbuilding uh, based on some dogmatic view of how financial markets were going to change. We had a very incremental approach where we wanted to uh, we wanted to invest resources and really demonstrate there was a, um, uh, a a profitable, sustainable business for us, and then reinvest and reinvest and and grow from from that standpoint. Um, as you might know, we we also get involved in early stage investing through uh, through Jump Capital, which is a captive venture capital company that we run. Uh, and we would sit down with entrepreneurs and say, you know, can you survive if the latter half of 2018 just goes straight into the future? Uh, and many of them were banking on the exponential growth really taking off to bail out their business model. Uh, and I think, uh, staying a little bit smaller than we, um, uh, perhaps thought was going to be our endpoint. Uh, but being able to um, continue to grow organically through uh, all the, the twists and turns of this market um, was something that we were pretty comfortable with. It's incredible to think really how much ground you're able to make up in such a short period of time whilst you're playing for the long-term gain. Um, you've really sort of achieved um, that market dominance uh, really quickly and it's evidence that this sector advances and evolves extraordinarily quickly as well. And how have you seen the industry change over the past few years? And, and certainly as we're based here in Hong Kong and majority of the callers um, or the audience are from Asia, how has the emergence of Asia factored into the growth of your business as well as the industry as a whole? I mean, there have definitely been distinct phases and our participation in this market comes many, many chapters in uh, from the, the real pioneers and the really uh, early innovators that, uh, that we tip our hats to that were, um, you know, uh, using, uh, very cutting edge, uh, maneuvers to try to acquire coin and, um, uh, and, and, and hopefully they, uh, they kept it. Um, I've got a lot more respect for the people that, uh, that maybe they bought it at a dollar and didn't sell at 10 and held on for the entire ride uh, than, uh, than just buying. I'm not sure I would have had the same, uh, same degree of uh, commitment and patience. Um, but when we entered, it, the, as I mentioned, the market was very fragmented. You had enormous, unpredictable arbitrage that was manifesting itself all over the place, largely due to the relatively immature state of the post-trade environment. You had most exchanges, uh, most venues on which you could trade required pre-funding and offered no leverage. So if you wanted to buy a thousand Bitcoin, you had to have the fiat in their account under your name, ready to go, much like uh, a, a lot of venues continue to work today. Um, and if that venue started to have the cheapest price and you wanted to buy more, but you didn't have the funds available, you had to wait for the international wire process, uh, which can be multiple days to replenish your buying power. Um, so the, the trades themselves, if you're a trading firm, were not complicated at all. Bitcoin would get um, tens of dollars, in some cases, hundreds of dollars disconnected from uh, the cheapest to the richest venue. Uh, so we spent a great deal of time on uh, really trying to understand and develop the post-trade architecture. Uh, some on the call may remember Noble Bank uh, uh, it, uh, during its period in this market from 2017 through 2018. 
uh, it ended up the, the business didn't work out for them, uh, although everybody, uh, uh, nobody lost money uh, that banked them. Uh, they were really the first fiat escrow agent uh, that allowed for 24 seven journaling of funds uh, and was the predecessor to what we're seeing from Silvergate and Signature and some other, uh, some other banks uh, fulfilling the same role now. So as soon as that happened, the market immediately went to be a nearly zero arbitrage environment uh, or on the order of modern markets uh, with prices on one venue versus another trading within a, uh, a tolerance that would, would be made up by the fee differ the, the fees you would have to pay uh, to do it. So there, it really went into many more modern trading strategies. You would try to do price prediction, uh, you would make very tight liquid markets. We saw a lot of spread compression. And your question about Asia, I think that the moment that we've enter, arrived at now and have been at for some time is really driven by Asia. It is a regulatory framework that allows retail part participation and leverage to be combined. And we've seen some of the perpetual swap venues and some of the levered offerings in Asia really take hold and create most of the global liquidity and price leadership uh, in this market. Um, uh, there's no question Asia is uh, seen as, as where the action is and, and, and we're no different in recognizing that right now. You put a, a, a nod out to the pioneers. Um, I've sort of uh, classed you as a trailblazer yourself. Um, the funny thing is there's still very much so a first mover advantage available to be seized. Um, what do you see as the biggest obstacles for institutional adoption and really taking and grabbing that? Yeah, I, I think that we have, we've re removed the most substantial obstacles. I think there was a period of great vulnerability uh, probably in 2018, where you had you had the potential for the G20 to come together and and really uh, deliver a very difficult blow to the digital asset market. Um, I think we're over that hump from uh, a the standpoint of the global regulatory community worrying about should we allow this to exist. They probably recognized that was not within their power, uh, but now we're on the back side of that, and I think that we're we're seeing a lot of those obstacles chip away. I agree with you, it's still extremely early. There's a lot of first mover room left, um, but banking, accounting, uh, and uh, sophisticated custody solutions that, that verge into prime brokerage, I think you get those three pillars underneath this, uh, underneath this table, and you'll see the institutional interest, and as Tom said in the earlier panel, uh, uh, a lot of new participants coming into the market uh, really start to come in with both feet and, and material amounts of capital. I think we have time for one last question. It's be a two-parter, but I'll just pause for a second to highlight a couple of the key takeaways that I'm gathering from this conversation. It's been fantastic. Thanks, Dave. Uh, number one, there's still very much a first mover advantage available. So uh, go out and grab that um, depending on whatever phase you're in and considering if it's still just curiosity or if uh, you're into experiment phase or if you're actually um, uh, uh, gone to market. I think with that as well, people really do matter. Uh, entrepreneurship and fostering that sort of environment internally will certainly help you and pay dividends later. And if not, uh, seek out good quality partners um, to be able to achieve that, whether that's through academia or, or commercial uh, entities. And lastly, I guess, from an Asia perspective, this is the growth engine. I think everyone hears that, um, certainly in traditional finance, regardless of whether you're investment banker, private banker, asset manager, uh, Asia will continue to be that. So finally, Dave, um, I think if this forms any indication that the worlds of digital assets and traditional finance seem to be far more harmonious and symbiotic than one may have believed maybe even a year ago, um, do you believe that fintechs in this space are now being seen or maybe even more so acting more as facilitators rather than disruptors? And then how does that bode for the future of capital markets? Yeah, look, I, I think there's a spectrum, uh, of course. Uh, you've got uh, some very traditional uh, approaches by some fintechs. Um, Libra's come up a couple times tonight. Um, that could be extraordinarily disruptive globally. Um, and the, the new East Asian uh, stablecoin that's, that's gotten some press this week 
Um, I think we're talking about a fundamental reshaping of the way uh, money is used in society. Uh, hard to be more disruptive than that. Um, the, you know, I think about BACT and what they're doing, trying to create a, a fluid wallet for many different types of digital assets, not just cryptocurrencies, but, um, you know, everything from World of Warcraft swords to frequent flyer miles to, to Bitcoin that you could use to, to buy a cup of coffee. Uh, I, we're, um, we're really at the, at the starting point for innovation with the digitization of money. Uh, and I think that the, the fintechs that I would imagine that are going to be the fang stocks of the, the digital currency movement uh, may be companies that we're not even, uh, we don't even know the names of today. Uh, I think it's, it's that early and uh, it's, uh, it's absolutely exciting to, uh, to be playing some role in, in this type of evolution. So um, looking forward to what's next. Thanks, Dave. Uh, back to you, Henry. Thanks so much, you guys. Some fantastic insights. Dave, you had me at uh, World of Warcraft Swords there. <laughs> more of a real-time strategy game player myself. Uh, so thank you again uh, to both of you. And uh, we have one more uh, event coming up. We have our closing remarks with David Seamer, the CEO of Wave Financial, in about five minutes. So thank you so much. All right, everyone, and welcome back. Uh, we now have our closing remarks from Dave Seamer, my boss and the CEO of Wave Financial. Thank you very much. Dave, take it away. Thank you. Uh, it's going to be one of many days. Uh, so on behalf of all of us at Wave Financial and OSL, you know, thank you so much for joining us for the second Wave Digital Assets Perspective Summit, which is kind of a mouthful. Uh, goal for this series of virtual sessions, bring together you know, the brightest minds to help shape the future of finance. Uh, first and foremost, want to give a huge thank you to OSL, particularly Dave and Wayne. Uh, OSL, OSL has been an amazing partner um, for this event. They're also a great business partners of ours in general. Uh, second, you know, just want to thank all of the panelists and speakers and keynotes and everyone. Uh, we're, you know, we're incredibly honored that so many you know, kind of entrepreneurs and investors you know, and all of the audience took the time to join us. Uh, many of them staying up pretty late past their bedtime. So a huge thank you. Uh, one of Wave's ambitions has always been to be the bridge between traditional finance world and the digital asset world. Uh, and these events are designed to foster those industry partnerships, as I assume everyone you know, that watched this could kind of tell from the kind of speakers we had. Um, so, uh, and, and really, really quick overview about Wave Financial, not to give a long commercial, you know, but Wave is a leading digital asset management firm. There's a registered investment advisor. Uh, we are, so we are a fully regulated company. We have two main business groups. One operates several separate digital asset funds uh, on strategies like venture capital investing, index and tracker funds, derivative based yield funds. Uh, we just launched a whiskey barrel aging fund, um, you know, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, that's a really unusual one. Uh, the second group in our business is our treasury management kind of managed account business, where we help large protocols, a lot of high net worth in investors maximize their crypto and fiat holdings, you know, through, typically through like derivative strategies and lending. Uh, and and yes, yeah, so this is a wrap. Uh, I do want to give one enormous amount of thanks to uh, the summit teams of both Wave and OSL for pulling all this together in a relatively short time. Uh, these things are never as easy as they look. Uh, and also, just everyone watch out. We will be doing in a third event in the series in the next month or so. We'll probably be announcing it next week. Uh, so look forward to seeing everyone back at that. Uh, so again, you know, I'm David Seamer, Wave Financial. Thank you so much for joining us and look forward to seeing everyone next time. Net. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. And have a good night. Have a good morning. Have a good day. And we will see you at the next event. Goodbye. <laughs>